Well, hello. This is the program called Getting to Know You. It was originated by Betty Osan, who was talking about fireside, fireplace, fireside stories. But we decided in Arizona that wasn't a very good idea. So we named it Getting to Know You instead. And today I have Marilyn Wurzberger, who um, has some very interesting stories to tell. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing them. <laughs> so, <clears throat> well, to start, I really have led a charmed life. I have to confess that to everyone. Um, it seems like <clears throat> many of the obstacles that I faced have been times for uh, allowing more growth. And, uh, but the first thing I wanted to say, Sharon suggested you'd like to know when we came here. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have been here 18 years as of this month. We moved in in August of 2002. Now, uh, actually, we've been non-resident residents since 1994. But uh, when we looked, we were looking at, uh, we looked at Friendship Village and we looked at Royal Oaks and Westminster and we knew people from all of there. And actually, I thought we would go to Friendship Village because so many faculty people from ASU were there. But um, we finally decided on Westminster. We had put our $500 down to be on the waiting list, which was only that much <laughs> at that time. And um, then they said, well, when would you like to move in? And I said, oh, I'm still working. Uh, no, we are not ready for a while. Well, when we turned in our papers for verification, the medical and all. Of course, we had to uh, tell them that Dick had been um, diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so they said, well, we don't take Parkinson's normally. And I said, oh, well, uh, how do we, <laughs> what do we do? Well, they said, um, <clears throat> well, then they said, then they sent out the papers. The doctors fed Dick that he probably wouldn't need to go. He was into a nursing home for three to five years. He was obviously a pretty good independent resident. He could pass the steps and all that sort of thing. So they said, well, if you buy in right now, uh, we'll take you. And I said, oh, but I, we don't wanna, I don't wanna move in for a while. Well, they said, uh, down the line, we might not take you with Dick's Parkinson could uh, progress. So um, we decided, okay, so this is our little house up north. We lived in Tempe at the time. And so we bought in, and um, <clears throat> so as I say, we were non-resident residents, but we had bought in. And uh, so um, Westminster benefited by our monthly dues for nine years until we really came in to use them. <clears throat> and as I told Marilyn, my mom lived here uh, when she died like nine years ago, but <clears throat> she used to tell me how impressed she was with this very amazing lady who with the librarian at ASU who would go off to work. And it was, it was good advertising from my mother's point of view. <laughs> yes, I worked for seven years after we moved in until 2009. <laughs> I took the bus, walked to the half mile to Poinsettia, boarded the bus, and came back the same way. <laughs> um, so, little did they know it would be a good marketing tool. <laughs> There were several of us who were working yes, about five yes, years yes. at that time. But ASU was impressive oh, to my mom, too. Oh, I see. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and tell us some more things. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, when Sharon and I talked about this before, she was interested in my contesting. <laughs> now, I had been, uh, my mother had been a contester in that she entered state fairs and she often she had several ribbon blue ribbons from being outstanding baking dish or you know, whatever that she won in the state fair and uh, i wasn't into cooking at that point too much uh, but i would enter these little contests you know write a jingle for this or a slogan for this and i won little prizes these were sometimes national contests sometimes not local they were local um, and I got things, one of my first winnings was a basketball, which is <laughs> And then I got a lovely desk set, which had two pins and a clock. And I had that on my desk at work and it was stolen. But I, so I don't have that anymore. 
Uh, but then I decided, well, I was got enticed by, uh, CBS was, ran this commercial or an ad or notice that they were looking for people to become televisitors from Ari a representative from Arizona. And the televisitor was to, we would have a trip to New York and Hollywood, and we would have a uh, write about reviews of the new t uh, TV shows that were going, coming up for the season. We'd be getting a preview of that week's stars. And I, uh, I was told I was a finalist, but not, not the winner. And so we each had a trial of reviewing uh, specific programs on CBS at that time, like one of the soap operas and and they're one of the re more talent shows sort of thing. And uh, so I submitted my reviews and then they said they would let, you, let us know by um, Labor Day. <clears throat> and Labor Day came and I didn't hear. And I was heartbroken. I thought, oh gosh, darn. The day after Labor Day, I got a call. <laughs> I was the finalist. <laughs> but I completely accepted the fact that I wasn't gonna win that contest. Well, Milt um, Evans was his name, and, and uh, we went down to uh, he, we were, went down to the studio, and I, I met the studio crew there, and they took some pictures of me with the TV camera and sitting at a desk, <clears throat> because I would be writing a, a column with my name, my picture, with the camera, uh, every day of reviewing the shows we'd seen and what I thought of them, that sort of thing. So my own little column. <clears throat> and we had to meet our deadline at night. We had to file by a certain time. It was like being a reporter. And um, we, so the very first night I got there, uh, first af late afternoon, uh, we, they had a cocktail party about four or five o'clock. And uh, you should have seen the reception room. It was a bar like none I've seen. I think every single kind of liquor and all that there. I mean, you could have a cocktail, you could make cocktails, they would do the whole thing. It was quite an elaborate setup. And uh, so I went up to order my usual ginger ale, please. <laughs> One of the vice presidents from CBS was standing there and he came over and he said, I want to meet the woman who ordered ginger ale. <laughs> And he said, I'm very impressed. <laughs> and so he uh, called me aside. We, we chatted for a while. He talked about how he liked to contest and how he heard how this was the contest for this was conducted. And he said he likes to fill in some of the blanks and that sort of thing. And uh, we chatted and we were having a great time. And he said, would you like to join me for dinner? And I said, Yes, and so he took me, uh, it wasn't far, we were staying at the Waldorf Hotel, and so uh, he said, we can just walk down to Trader Vic's. It was in a <clears throat> high rise, uh, not too far from the hotel, so we walked down. And so uh, he said, what would you like for dinner? And he said, he said, I know you don't want any liquor, <laughs> you know, you don't want to <laughs> drink. But what he did is he ordered a drink that came in a coconut, shell and it was topped with a gardenia and he ordered that as special to give me the gardenia <laughs> and so we had a delicious dinner and we chatted and so we walked back to the hotel and as we were walking back we passed a telephone booth that's those were the days of telephone booths and he pulled out his telephone car calling card which i kept i knew existed but i didn't have one and he said, now call your husband and tell him you're all fine. <laughs> and I did. And it was very, very sweet, very sweet. And we kept in touch. He took my address and we exchanged Christmas greetings every year. Uh, and believe it or not, I mean, I was so surprised. Uh, that was in 1950, uh, 58, 59, and 59. And um, in 1960, Two. That was when I won a trip to the Pillsbury Bake Off. It was also held in New York at the Waldorf Hotel. <laughs> and uh, so I sent Mr. Jameson a note. I said, lightning does strike twice in the same place. I'm going to be New York at the, uh, for the 
um, for the Pillsbury. And uh, so when I got there, he had checked and he left a message for me to call him when I got back, left his telephone number, and he said, are you, do you have any plans? And so the first night getting there, most people are just coming in. There wasn't really anything planned. And he said, would you like to join me for dinner again? And so we had him caught up. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. He, uh, he had been in Phoenix, but he hadn't given me a call, but he said he had visited our station and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> I'm making this <laughs> a little too long, I think. Yeah, like, but it was so interesting to meet Mr. Jameson again under another circumstance. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bake Off was fun. Or it was fun, and that's when I had uh, I had entered my <coughs> bacon and cheese puff pie. Now you can't you can't see, the top, but here I am working at my uh, dad is working at my stove there, mm -hmm. and uh, no, this, no, the first was my cherry go rounds, and it was a cherry coffee cake, and Dick and I still enjoy enjoy that coffee cake. You could ask. <laughs> Only we thought we got sort of tired of it because I was baking it up to make it special. But uh, uh, that that bake off was uh, quite uh, by by today's standards. Everybody's every nothing was quick. No nothing was made with any mixes. Everything was definitely by scratch. Cream your butter and sugar, add your flour, that sort of thing. And so I made my yeast dough and. And of course, that took a little longer than some recipes because they had to let it dry. But uh, <clears throat> I got. Uh, uh, it, but interestingly, when I was told when the uh, the higher the the uh, judges, the officials from Pillsbury came to my home to tell me I had won uh, my trip to to New York. Uh, I had, they wanted me to bake the cake, uh, coffee cake for them, which I did, and I had it all to show it. And I said, well, gentlemen, would you like a piece of cake? And the, <clears throat> the photographer said, oh no. <laughs> he said, you know, I, I photographed too much fake food, and, and the uh, judge, <laughs> the executives who were there said, come on, Joe, you can <laughs> eat this. This is really good, <laughs> unlike what you normally see. <laughs> but, um, I was not a contender at all on that first bake-off. I had a lot of fun, had a lot of fun, and they treated us well. We took some tour of New York and staying at the Waldorf. And I remember ordering up my breakfast, <laughs> which was very, I was uh, not too hungry because uh, uh, we were um, going to be eat, having so many, you know, baking and all that sort of thing. And I ordered a a slice of melon and and, and a, a croissant or something like that a pastry and the breakfast was four dollars <laughs> and at that time you know you could buy at, in Phoenix you could get a steak dinner for probably three <laughs> I was so shocked <laughs> at that but uh, anyhow the bake-off was fun and uh, surprisingly uh, Every, uh, the rules are that no one can attend the Bake Off more than three times, so I had another time. So I entered again, and my bacon and cheese puff pie, wow, that, that uh, was much more spectacular, shall I say. And um, Dorothy Polson, who was the editor, food editor for the Republic Gazette, uh, she was there, and she uh, kept parading me around. She said, this is our next winner. She's going to be, our next winner is going to be from Arizona. <laughs> and, she, and, and she was a great booster. And uh, again, we were, uh, the, the banquet, uh, the inner banquet was, um, we are all sitting, it, it's arranged at where you're told where you're to sit. That's for the cameraman to know ahead of time when you, you knew the winner. And uh, so, uh, and, and I, I, I was, <laughs> I saw uh, Art, Art Linkletter again. Uh, he didn't um, uh, recognize me from when uh, uh, I, he had interviewed me before when I was on a televisitor trip. He didn't recognize me, but anyhow. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, uh, so we were seated on our round table and, and everyone, and so 
when they were announcing I was in the refrigerator dough business because I had used the uh, uh, crescent roll dough for my crust and then the bacon and cheese and soup plates. And, all. and um, so uh, when our link letter got to uh, round to announcing the refrigerator dough uh, category, he said, well, who, who had uh, tomatoes? Raise your hand. I raised my hand. Who had um, a cheese? My hand was still up. Who had oregano? And people, and the person right next to me was the winner. And so we were both on camera, and uh, my staff at work were saying, Marilyn's going to win, Marilyn's going to win. <laughs> but I didn't. I was next to the winner. <laughs> But that was still sort of exciting, really, at that point. <laughs> so, but um, there were a couple of things in the, when I was on the televisitor uh, trip, <clears throat> we got to meet all these stars. And at, at these receptions, if we, we flew uh, to first to New York, we had three days there, and we had another three days in Hollywood. And uh, we flew back first class, in a jet. That was the first jet flight, first class uh, to Hollywood. And uh, there we had a reception and we had uh, uh, Jack Benny. He was not friendly at all. <laughs> Jackie Cooper was a delight. He said, oh, you're from Arizona. He said, I'd like to go over to Arizona and hunt. And we chatted a little bit about the fun of Arizona. And then, of course, my stellar performance here on the photos here. I don't know if you can tell, if you can see President Reagan. <laughs> he wasn't president then. He was just one of the star of the CBS uh, uh, shows, uh, G the GE Theater or something like that. And uh, so he uh, he was there. And uh, then I had this other uh, picture and I people laughed at this. This is Dennis Weaver that we saw. And there I am, and Mar everyone said, Marilyn, are you sure you were just j drinking ginger ale then? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> ginger ale can make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had a, a lot of fun on, on those things. But in uh, the Bake Off, as I said, my the only time in my life that I would ever, ever, ever <laughs> be a centerfold was on, <laughs> I was a centerfold here. My recipe is centerfold of a cookbook. <laughs> Bacon and cheese, so far. So there I did get recognition. <laughs> and as I told Marilyn, our son worked for Pillsbury. And when he was hired, they then made the little dough boy politically correct and he lost weight. <laughs> The dough boy was chubby for a long yeah. time, but they were they politically correct, <laughs> made him thin. So, so uh, well, uh, after all of that contesting, I did try to get to see if I could get the third time on to Pillsbury, but I never could because they went to more of the using all the box mixes and that's and I'm not that kind of cook. I still like to do it by scratch mm -hmm. and all. So that that was where my my strength lay. <laughs> and, and what did you tell me they used for ice cream? Oh, oh, uh, yeah. the photographer was telling me a little bit about making the fake food for the, and he said they used mashed potatoes a lot of times for ice cream and, yeah. and various <laughs> substances, and they uh, spray over it with chemicals to, you know, to let make them look fresh and glistening and all that. He said he wouldn't dare eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and then? Uh, there are more adventures. Well, after after the Bake Off and all that sort of thing, well, one thing that we did is we took one exotic trip. Well, we took, Dick loved to travel. I loved to travel. And um, he didn't love to travel when we were first married, but I encouraged him for our 10th anniversary. I said, could we go, could we take a trip to Europe? And uh, he said, why do you want to go to Europe? And I said, not so many people up at the university. They're, they're great travelers. That's all that means. 
It was not sold on the whole. I said, this would make a wonderful 10th anniversary celebration. Well, we were not much willing to really celebrate birthdays or anniversaries, but he thought he'd think on it. Well, I was so fortunate. An engineer that reported to him had just come back from taking a Globus trip to Europe. And he came back and with glowing reports, he said, Dick, you'd really enjoy it and all that. Well, of course, then Dick had to, <laughs> he couldn't be outdone. <laughs> so he got interested, so he went and got a Globus flyer and was about to looking at it. And, and he said, well, maybe we could do this. And so eventually we made the down payment and uh, uh, made a reservation. And up until the last day, I wasn't sure that he was ready to go. He was sort of, <laughs> but Dick was, uh, and once we got there, and and we, uh, um, our one first flight went to London, and he saw, and we were seeing the changing of the guard, and we were seeing Blenheim Palace, and we were seeing all these, and history that he had read about it, not been too interested, all became a lot. And uh, in fact, he was, uh, this was, in 1965, when we took our first trip, uh, when he, uh, it was hot weather, it was in July, and, and no air conditioned buses at that time. And we'd had a heavy meal sort of for lunch, and I was sort of dozing and did, are you going to sleep your way through Europe? <laughs> and, and everyone said, Dick was the brightest eyed, bushy tailed <laughs> traveler. If you want to know what happened, he's the only one that didn't sleep on the bus. <laughs> and, uh, and as soon as we disembarked from our flight, Dick said, Well, where are you going? Where, where, where shall we go next? And so he was hooked. That was it. And so from then on, he would look to see what was what was good, what was what we could afford, first of all, and then <laughs> what we'd like to do within those parameters. And so we, we really did a lot of wonderful trips. But one of our most exotic trips was, he surprised me when he said, well, how would you like to have Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, I should say, New Year's Eve at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna? And my I, my jaw dropped and I said, ooh. <laughs> Sounds good. So he arranged for us to have uh, we, we got on this special tour uh, to have uh, see New Year's Eve at the Hofburg Palace. We danced the night away, literally. We had a beautiful dinner, and then they had this floral clock that um, clocked, you know, counted down the hours until New, uh, New yeah. Year's Eve. And then they passed out champagne glasses to all of us there and uh, drank to the new year. And then of course they played the Blue Danube Waltz for everyone <laughs> to uh, dance. And uh, so then we had a few other things with part of that tour to see the Lipizzaner stables and, we, um, and the horses perform. And, and we saw the New Year's Day concert of the, uh, at the Music Verein, which was a great trip. Well, at that time, if you, took at least 11 days of an overseas trip, you could, um, it was cheaper than if, you, if we just gone over for New Year's Eve, the four, four days or five days for that. So we, t we added, so we made a two week trip and went down to Egypt. And then we had a two week trip of Egypt, which was quite exciting and uh, just one of our wonderful adventures. <laughs> what stands out in your mind on the, the Egypt trip? Pardon? What stands out in your mind? Oh this? well, of course, just just all of the all of the monuments and things, mm -hmm. and uh, going uh, and it was funny. I did got a little bit um, annoyed. The guide, as we were going into the large pyramid, uh, sort of, and the guide wanted to keep holding my hand, and it was not <laughs> like, please do that. <laughs> He wanted to die. <laughs> but we had a great we had a great trip on that. <laughs> what about the food? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the food was delicious. Right. And uh, at that, we were seated. Fortunately, we had no way of knowing. We were seated at a table with an English couple, mm -hmm. and so we could talk to them. He was a former professor, and of course, uh, the fact that I was associated with the university, we had a, a good point of meeting. 
there. And uh, by the time the evening was over, they said, oh, please come. And they gave us their address. And uh, could we meet them? Would we like to meet them at their home in England? And we exchanged Christmas cards for a few years, but we never did get their meeting there. But, but it was a, a great experience. And they, of course, at the palace, they had orchestras in about four different rooms. You could go to the modern room, you could go to the waltz room, you could <laughs> go, you know, uh, various, and string, one, one room was just a string quartet playing, you, not really dance music, so it was, but it was quite, quite exciting. And Dick, uh, I, at five, they were supposed to close down at about 5.30, but 5 a.m. I was really <laughs> Dick was still preparing to go. He still wasn't sleeping. No. <laughs> uh, so uh, many other adventures, but uh, I didn't plan to give a travel log here. <laughs> and but I used one of the things that Dick was so good at uh, boning up on where we were and exactly you know that's not just a fountain, but that's the Buckingham Fountain, say, or the whatever. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a Lord Nelson statue or something and so he was the photographer and I took notes <laughs> and um, so what we would do is he would prepare uh, he would prepare a presentation of our slides and I would prepare foods of the areas which we had so we would have a big buffet following his presentation of the slides and I would put up an advertisement in the library staff or when I said anybody who wants to see our slides you're welcome to come well I sometimes had as many as 35 guests coming yeah. to see our slides <laughs> and uh, staff would come year after year and they we didn't have our slides running and they said when are you going to when we're going to see your slides of China or, or when are we going to see those slides and um, uh, so uh, I would make usually about 20 different dishes that we had eaten. I mean, so if we'd gone to five countries, I had to have something from every one of the countries. And Dick once said to people, do you come for the eats or for the pictures? And they said, you'll never say <laughs> what we prefer. But that was part of our our, our travel was, was the, the slide deck. And at that time, remember 1965, 1968, and all the jet, jet planes were just coming in, into use. And travel was not not that extensive. Mm -hmm. And so what I felt, if we were so fortunate to have this, and so many of my friends, colleagues, they were raising kids, or, you know, they were not, if they didn't have two salaries, they were not doing too well. And so they would come and travel vicariously, and they, they so appreciated it. It was like we were sharing part of our life. So it wasn't to brag, but it was to share, really. And they thought it was that way. And then? <laughs> well, then we decided to, uh, after Dick left, he, Dick resigned from Motorola, his resignation came when we were in Egypt. Uh, he sent a cable from the Cairo Hilton and said, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so, and of course, I, I was a little apprehensive about that, but uh, he did it, and uh, we survived, obviously. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting that Dick was always known as, uh, I heard from some of his former colleagues and people who were still at Motorola, and they said, Dick is known now as Mr. Success, anyone who can resign from Cairo, Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> it was a success story in its own right. But after, after he retired, he decided we would build a house, our own home. He'd been wanting to do that for a long time. And so he designed it. He wanted a French chateau in the desert. <laughs> a little bit incongruous, but that's what he wanted. And who was I to say no? And so he designed it. He designed, and being an engineer, he was a great draftsman, he drew up the plans and, and all that. We had, he had some other plans to sort of go by, but which he modified and, and did things. And so then he took them to two architects uh, to uh, 
to check his calculations and all that to make sure that his math was okay and, and all that. And, and two of them said, they're, they're fine, you did a good job. So then we went ahead and uh, one of his colleagues at Motorola had a, so a contractor's license and Marcy said to Dick, you can use my license as a contractor. And so Marcy had staff, people to call, cement people, lock people, and all that sort of thing. So Dick began lining up the, uh, all the stages, you know, uh, for, for building a house. And uh, <laughs> we, we went through all of this construction and <laughs> we lived in our house. We, uh, we moved into our house before it was finished. Now the city was not happy about that, but they finally agreed to pick up our garbage. That was the biggest problem if when we moved up, to, uh, moved in, and uh, so we we moved in with the bare essentials. But Dick had been thinking ahead, so he got a 220 uh, service entrance for the electricity. So we had plenty to power the whole house, not just for the contractors you know, chainsaw, uh, <laughs> bench saws and that sort of thing. And um, so we had water. You have to have all that for construction. And uh, so uh, we moved in and, uh, and we finally got permission from the, uh, from the uh, city. And, uh, and in fact, we were five years building that house. <laughs> And, and when we moved in, I, I brought a couple of pictures. I don't know if you can see, but. <clears throat> and may I say, for people to locate, that house is right by oh. Kareem School. Oh, oh this, this, this house, this was our house. Uh, this was in 1974. <laughs> it was just the shell is there. It was, a, uh, it was in Buena Vista Rancho's uh, subdivision. And we were right between, uh, McLennan and Rural and Warner, Elliot and Warner, wow. right down in, in that area. And there was nothing there, hardly. It was a new subdivision, and so it was not a subdivision. Everybody had their own homes, uh, custom what built home. And uh, so uh, it was sort of shocking. <laughs> I mean, it was sort of <laughs> lonely to be there. And so uh, when we moved in, everything was just sort of, uh, you can see, here, here was my uh, surface unit, my cooktop, but the uh, controls for that cooktop were up with the vent hood. So the hood was <laughs> connected, you can see the pipe. And uh, I had to, uh, but the hood was, um, the hood was just hanging from the rafters so that I could reach the uh, controls for the stove there. And then right beside it, you can see, here's my double oven sitting in its carton. And we used it slightly for the pantry there. <laughs> and you can see uh, here was my kitchen. We had some uh, used cabinets that we put in and my, uh, my sink was sitting on my sewing machine table. <laughs> but the garbage disposal worked and the dishwasher was sitting in its crate but it was hooked up and working. And you can see here we hung our clock on the, on the furring strips. We just had, the, as you can see there, the slump lock and the furring strips. And we had, uh, the first thing we put in was sheetrock in the bathroom. <laughs> so that we could have a door, <laughs> which was a good thing to have in the bathroom. But we had, we did have the john and we had the bathtub. And so for the first few days, I had to wash my dishes in the bathtub because we didn't have the kitchen sink hooked up yet. And but <laughs> now this really was the Pillsbury. <laughs> <laughs> this really was, it really was living, uh, living very, uh, uh, Barely, and then we just gradually keep kept adding things all along. And um, when Plus you, you see, entertained there, you said. Pardon? You entertained also. Uh, yes, we entertained, <laughs> and I had promised I had promised uh, one of my former assistants that if she should ever get pregnant, they wanted to have a child so badly. And I said, Well, if you ever get pregnant, I promise you a shower. Well, here we were living in this. <laughs> 
And uh, so I had the shower and most people came in and said, wow, because you came in and there was this big entry hall and we had the chandelier hanging, but it was, the stairs weren't ready. The stairs weren't there. And we had to use a ladder to get upstairs. And um, the insulation wasn't all there. We had just blinds at the windows, but, uh, <laughs> but the chandelier was there <laughs> for the future. And one other thing that we had, this was, this was just, as I say, I've led a charmed life. Things worked out so well. In the library, they were replacing the carpeting in the reference area. The reference area was, you know, several times the size of this room. And, um, and I saw the men down there rolling up the carpet, the old carpet. And I said, well, what are you doing with this? And they said, it's going to the dump. And I said, oh, could we have it? And I said, sure. So I called Dick, I said, come on up, you can get some carpet. So this red carpet, which actually in some places wasn't hardly worn at all, some places were bad. But um, so I, I saw Dick down there rolling, helping the men roll up carpet and moving it into our station wagon, which he parked on the dock. And uh, so that carpet carpeted, completed our, the, the main floor of our of our house and so we had carpet on these hard <laughs> concrete floors <laughs> so that added to the ambiance of our entertaining we did have carpet believe it or not even though it was a used library stuff and that red carpet served us for five for the five years it was interesting that that came available soon after we moved in and, and it, we really were i mean the Oh, concrete gets pretty cold. <laughs> but uh, the first, when we, we moved in in April of 73, and uh, we had, there was no air conditioning or heating set there. And that was one of the hottest Aprils <laughs> Arizona had seen. Well, we've probably seen some since, but at that time it was the hottest. And so um, our, our roof, here, you, did I show the, you know, the picture of the house? That was a fake mansard roof there. And it was, uh, so it was built up, but it was a flat roof behind it. So what we did is we put our cots up on the roof and we slept out on the roof for about a month or so, maybe more. Uh, but we didn't have any stairs upstairs, so we had to use the step ladder to get upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> and so we slept, and it was, it was very interesting because we'd set up, and it was cool then because that was, there were still a lot of the fields around us, and so we got cool breezes. And then you could just feel, you know, they talk about the heat islands from the, from the town, and we could feel that move out as the wind blew, it, and we'd get all this heat blow over us and then from the city, and then we'd warm up, kick off our <laughs> covers, be hot, and then as that moved on, and it was cool again. So you could really tell the heat I was there. <laughs> and then if I remember, you also had a guest that you didn't expect, like a bird? Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes. The first night we were in, the first night we got in, <laughs> we, we woke up and we heard this bird <laughs> chirping and he, <laughs> he was swinging. <laughs> and we tried to chase him out, of course, to get up the chandelier to try to get <laughs> up the, uh, uh, step ladder on the chandelier uh, to chase him out with twice. And, we, and of course we had critters come in because we weren't all that tight yet. <laughs> so for a day or two, we did still have birds and Dick was trying to find out where they were getting in. But they, they seemed to think it was their house, not ours. The bird house. <laughs> so, right. And of course there were cotton fields all around us at that time. And uh, um, so, uh, they'd come over with a sprayer sometimes, you know, early in the morning and night. And we didn't get sprayed, really, but they were sprayed pretty close mm -hmm. to us at that point. Mm -hmm. So, anyhow, you get some of the fun of, of uh, having... Oh, yes, I also entertained the faculty. Uh, we had our <laughs> librarians council, our professional librarians, and so we had a Halloween party, and it seemed very appropriate to have it in our unfinished <laughs> house. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so uh, so we, we had it and, and uh, 
it, it was fun, and everybody got, got a kick out of it, more so than the people that came to the shower, frankly. <laughs> and, and my Christmas letter, uh, one of the years that we were in the house, I said, <clears throat> the quote uh, was, so you want to build your own house? Well, to build or not to build, that is the question. <laughs> Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the noise and plumbing of outrageous housing, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them, to build, to sleep no more until the house is finished, and thus find the thousand nat natural shocks that flesh is heir to, with apologies to Mr. Shakespeare. <laughs> but people got a kick out of my Christmas letter that year. <laughs> and when the house was really finished, did you have a party? Uh, we entertained at various times. Sometimes we had some Christmas parties and uh, groups over. And first then there were our, our, we were traveling again mm -hmm. over and uh, travel parties. So, uh, and at that time we had an organ, Dick had got an organ, and we had um, an extra speaker, got a speaker to put up in the uh, upstairs. And so we had that wow. surround sound <laughs> of the organ. And so when we had, uh, some of these parties, some of our friends who were really, we invited them to play and, you know, gave them a, <laughs> a gratuity, so to speak. But uh, uh, if it, the house would just rock with music from, from the organ and all that. So that was Did the fun. organ exist at the time of the Halloween party? Yes. I was thinking of the Phantom of the Opera or something. <laughs> at the, no, we didn't have anyone who could play that, 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 that one. <laughs> Uh, we, none of us librarians, uh, we had had some in the past that had played, but uh, none at that, at that particular time. <laughs> but, uh, in, and I guess the only other thing that I thought I might talk about, just, just a few moments, is that um, I, I would plan, I had been teaching fourth and fifth grade and, and like certificate, teaching certificates and all that, and but um, as teachers are always supposed to be enhancing their studies with additional courses. I did uh, take some library science courses and I decided, I thought, oh, I, I think it would be fun to be a school librarian. And so I was, um, I was, I was not teaching at the time. That's another long story. <laughs> <Why not? laughs> Very interesting, but way too long to tell. Um, so I, when I, I had finished my library courses enough to get my certificate, my teaching library certificate. And so I went to the placement bureau at ASU and uh, uh, Dr. Minky, I was very, he said, you know, Marilyn, this is the worst year that if you wanted to get a school librarianship, there were budget cuts, libraries were being cut and librarians were being cut rather than added. And um, he said, uh, he said, why don't you, why don't you take this job over at ASU? He said, it's, it's a cataloging job. You've had, you've had the training for that. Why don't, why don't you consider, just consider it a temporary job until library field gets better. And so I applied for the job and uh, <laughs> Mr. Bachelor was the librarian later people said Marilyn you can't work for Mr. Bachelor he's oh, it's difficult I said well, I can work with anyone I think you know but anyhow my interview was um, uh, Mrs. Wurstberger uh, you would, what, what's your favorite part of librarianship I said I really love reference work and he said well I have a cataloging job and uh, so he went and it was a day, we used to work a 39 hour week and most of the catalog department took off Thursday afternoon and that's when he scheduled my interview for. So there were no librarian, catalog librarians in the cataloging department that, that, that afternoon. So he introduced me to the desk, he said, this is Miss Atlin's desk, this is me. This man. <laughs> and uh, then he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, your references are very good. And he said, you're not the kind of person that I hire. He said, you're the Cadillac and mink coat proud. I had neither at the time. But he said, uh, uh, if you want the job, you can have it. 
And I sort of went, oh, do I want it? <laughs> After such an introduction. But uh, Dick and I were anxious to buy a house, and, and if I were working, we could qualify for the mortgage a little bit better, easily. And so I took the job, and I thought, Dr. Minky said, just consider it a temporary job, because he knew Mr. Bachelor's reputation. And he, more people resigned than had stayed. And so I took the job. And um, my temporary job resulted in 48 and a half years of service. <laughs> and I went from cataloger to uh, I head of the reclassification division from the old Dewey to the new Library of Congress system. I was in that. And I, I was getting tired of that, so I asked to just go back to, cat right out of the river, to cataloging. So the associate university librarians of Maryland, he said, I'd like to tap you to be our rare books cataloger. And I said, oh, I'm not too knowledgeable. He said, I'll teach you. And so he gave me the equivalent of a Lilly fellowship, to, you know, a, a library course. So he was a rare book librarian at heart. He, he was not an administrator, he knew it, but he missed being with rare books so what he would do, he would come down to my desk a lot of times, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon when he got tired of all the things that he had to do as an administrator and to spend some time with the books. So we had all the rare, the rare books that came through the, uh, at my desk. And so he would take me and we'd go over the books and he'd say, now Marilyn, what's, let me tell show you what's important about this. He said, now look at the binding here, or look at the print here, look at who's the publisher, and uh, all the various things to describe about it. He said, now the reference books, we need to consult for these, and we would go out to the reference room and check how that book should be checked to be described. When you're cataloging a rare book, it, be, it should be uh, these detailed, the bibliographical details should be noted in depth and all for future scholars and all for comparison of volumes and all because there's lots of points. And so, and when he would come down, we, I had a lot of fun. We were smiling and, and we joked a lot. Well, <clears throat> the head of cataloging did not like that. She was a little jealous that Mr. Dobkin was paying attention to me. And she and he used to go out to dinner for a while, and she sort of thought I was horning in, I guess, I don't know, impinging on her territory. Uh, so she said, um, she had said to me, Marilyn, uh, first of all, Marilyn, you're much too happy. If you don't calm, <laughs> cool it a bit, I'm going to have to move your desk. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, yeah, and she, she was unhappy. I, would, I could eat everything I wanted, and, and I didn't get. I stayed thin and she had just the opposite <laughs> problem there. <laughs> and so uh, Mr. Dobkin realized that there was a slight problem there. And so he said, you know, Marilyn, I think it would work well if we moved your desk up to special collections and you can do your cataloging up there. You can always come down to consult the reference books, but you can do it there. And then you can also serve as a backup in that department because they didn't have much staffing. They just had one one staff, the head of the staff. He said, and you can meet the people that are using the material. So uh, we moved my desk up there, and so Miss Haskell then had no <laughs> and And Mr. Dobkin would give me tests all the time. For example, he'd give me a book cat catalog sent out by publishers, uh, you know, book uh, bookstores, and all that sort of thing. And he would give me a test. He'd say, now, if you have $1,000 to spend, uh, what, what might you buy? Of course, he'd look through the catalog himself. And so then he'd come up a few days later. He said, well, what, what, what are you going to buy? What would you buy? And he'd say, oh, that, that's a good one. And then he'd say, well, why not this? So I had to defend my purchases. Or, or why this? I had to defend. So it was a, it was a fun give and take all the time sort of thing. Well, <clears throat> then Mr. Do uh, Mr. Dobkin got hepatitis uh, really bad, and he was so bad that the, doc the doctor said that he would be confined, he would recommend that he not go back to work for probably four to six months. And so Mr. Dobkin resigned, and here I was up here, and, and 
<clears throat> he, Mr. Dobkin, did not like my predecessor, the person who was in charge. And so uh, about this time, my predecessor had retired, had resigned. He was going on to work on his doctorate, he said. So there was no head of special collections. And so uh, uh, Mr. Dobkin uh, said, uh, uh, he said, do you mind acting as the head? And uh, I said, no, that's fine. And so later, Dr. Kep uh, came in as our new librarian, and uh, he said, I would like to evaluate staffing for the place, so would you mind being acting head of the collection? And I said, no, I'm very happy. And so a year later, I said to Ms. Dr. Kep, I said, are you ever going to make a decision about <laughs> He said, Oh, he said you've been doing such a good job. Uh, I, I, I didn't even, I'd forgotten all about it. So <laughs> he graciously put in, put in, he advertised for my position, but he did not say required the MLS, which I did not have, uh, the Masters of Library Science. So uh, it was, it was uh, desired or desirable, but not required. And so there were three other applicants, Dr. Kip said, I think you're the best, and so that's how I got promoted. And head of special collections for 30 years. And when I knew that, when we moved into Westminster, one of my first encounters with you was inviting you to our apartment for you to see a rare book that we had, because I had purchased a, um, there were 50 copies of this particular book that bowls out, okay. it's just yeah. very fancy, yeah. and I just was so proud of it. And the person who made the book was a client of mine, so I was going to show Marilyn this beautiful rare book, and she already had it in the library <laughs> and knew all about it. <laughs> so it was fun. It was, it was fun. fun, yes, I recall so, that. Uh -huh. So well, I've been talking way too long. Well, I think it's been very interesting. So <laughs> I you may be the only one who thinks so. <laughs> well, that's one. <laughs> and uh, I so appreciate your sharing these special times and memories. Okay. And uh, thank you very, very You're much. You're welcome. Very much.